everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Building Sustainable Collaborations from the Start. My name is Rute Ojibo and I'm a senior community animator here at TAMRAC for the CBYF team, so the Communities Building Youth Futures team. Um, so before we begin our discussion, I would like to acknowledge that we are all meeting on Indigenous lands. I'm currently located in Waterloo, which is the traditional territory of the Neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet, and we thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who have taken care of this land. Um, so I would like to introduce our speakers today. Unfortunately, Liz Weaver, our co-CEO at Tamrac, will not be joining us, but we are joined by Natalie Blanchett, the director of the Communities Building You Trutures team here at Tamrac, Mike Deja Dans, the manager of sustainability and development, also for the Communities Building You Trutures team, as well as Kelly C. Stevens, um, a senior advisor at Suncor Foundation. So welcome to our speakers. Um, just before we get into it, um, the webinar, this webinar is part of a four part series on sustainability and resilience, and it is based out of our most recent 10 guide, a guide for building a sustainable and resilient collaboration. So the goal for the guide is to explore the factors that contribute to sustainable to a sustainable, resilient and impactful collaboration. It also provides ideas and practices that will enable collaboratives to build resiliency, questions that funders and collaboratives can explore and work through, as well as stories and lessons learned from communities in their sustainability journey. So it is available in both English and French, and I encourage you to check it out. It is very useful and provides lots of resources. Um, I'm sure Jamie will be able to pop those into the chat. Um, Joe, so firstly, um, I think I'll start with you, Mike. Um, what are what was the thinking behind the development of this guide? Were there trends we saw? Why did we think it was important to develop? Yeah, thanks, Rute. Um, and good morning, everyone, or uh, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, so Tamarca has spent the last 20 years supporting place-based work um, in over 400 cities <laughs> across Canada and around the world. Um, we've learned a lot during that time about what collaborations can do to be sustainable and resilient um, and what challenges them. So we decided to develop a, a 10 guide to unpack the concepts of sustainability and resilience um, and break down the information into edible chunks. So uh, Rute, you've kind of gone over what those look like within the guide. Um, so to develop the guide, we engaged in an advisory committee that included representatives of collaborations, funders, uh, community-based practitioners, and thought leaders um, to share their wisdom with us. Um, we connected with collaborations across Canada uh, to share their stories of sustainability and resilience. Um, and we researched what others have been contributing to the conversation um, about these two very important topics. Um, shout out to Kelly, who gave of her time uh, and shared her wisdom and experience with us on our advisory committee for the guide. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so the guide was developed as part of the Community Building uh, Youth Futures Initiative of Tamarack, specifically to support those communities uh, in determining how to build sustainable collaborations. Um, but we made it open and accessible to all collaborations. So uh, this would be a great opportunity to invite Natalie to briefly share a bit about uh, communities building youth futures uh, and how building a sustainability mindset has been helpful to CBYF communities. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Rute, as well. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. So with Communities Building Youth Futures, when we developed the model and implemented it starting in, uh, in 2020, we used the experience of TAMRAC, the place-based experience that TAMRAC um, Institute had developed to really think about um, and get communities on the right foot thinking about sustainability and thinking about uh, the people, resources, process, and uh, impact that would set them up for, for that sustainability and resilience. So in terms of people, um, we had youth um, as in the, in the model we developed, we have youth as a central part of the design and implementation. Um, we pay um, special attention to the equity and inclusion of youth for each community. So that's going to look a little bit different from community to community. 
for resources, we ensured that communities would have the backbone supports needed to be able to provide um, the, the leadership table in the community, the resources to action the work uh, of the leadership table and, and decisions being made. Um, the process that we used in the model and implementation started with um, looking at the preconditions of collective impact for each community, thinking about um, the, uh, the case, the compelling case, thinking about the urgency and the need to support youth um, in their learning journeys. And from there, we, um, throughout the whole process of communities building youth futures, we're engaging youth and we're engaging the whole community um, to develop a common agenda, to develop priorities, uh, and to develop compelling reasons to do this work. And then in terms of the impact, um, thinking about impact in the design and implementation, we um, are using a lot of data to design our case studies, impact posters, guides on a page, and we're working across all of our communities, which is very common to um, our other practice areas at Tamra. Um, we developed a network and a community of practice. We have three community of practices uh, every month so that communities can learn from each other and um, can support their thinking around um, system change and policy change. Awesome. Thanks, Natalie. And thanks, Mike, for going over the guide, the development of the guide really quickly. Um, so we talk a lot about sustainability, and I think everyone has like different definitions of what exactly that could mean. So maybe we should start there. What exactly is that? And what does that mean to you? So maybe we'll start with you, Kelly, and then we can go over to Mike and Natalie. Sure. And thanks, everyone, for having me here. I'm calling in from Treaty 7 in a place that many of you may know as Calgary in the Blackfoot name for that is Mokinsis, which is a word for elbow and refers to where two rivers meet. And before I answer your question directly, Rute, I think it's probably just helpful for me to say a couple of things that aren't in the, in the speaker bio that you'll have available on the website that Jamie just linked to. There's a few things that inform how I think about collaboration in general and, and then the sustainability of it. One, um, I have a really highly privileged social location. My past and current identities have all held a lot of privilege and that's for sure affected my biases. And I try to be aware of that effect, but don't get it 100% right all the time. And, and I'm aware that um, my ongoing learning can be a burden for, for others in this work. Another thing that contributes to where I come from on this topic is I grew up in a really small, remote Northern Canadian town that was far from everything and we had to do everything ourselves. So we all had to work together if we were to sustain anything that was, that was community focused. I've also had a couple of career paths. One was a series of corporate roles that led me to burnout and an early change into social work where I started by managing a multi-stakeholder and very collaborative but often tricky youth gang prevention program. And, and now I'm here with the Suncor Energy Foundation, which is combining both of those pre previous career paths in ways that often make people have assumptions about me that are, that are often opposing. Um, sometimes in settings like this, I represent to some folks all the evils of capitalism. And, and then in other settings, like when I'm with Suncor folks, I'm just a naive socialist. And I think the power of the two of those things together is, is um, grounds me in a belief that I really think we need multiple sectors involved if we're going to create any lasting solutions to today's problems and sustain our work together. So in terms of like, what does sustainability mean to me? I'll first be the annoying panelist who twists the question around because I actually don't think it matters what sustainability means to me. Um, I'm not just trying to be annoying though. I think what's important is it matters a lot more what sustainability means to the community members who are involved or, the, or who you're trying to serve in community when, when we're talking about an initiative that needs to be sustained or doesn't. Um, I think many of us, me included, get really hung up on sustaining a program or a role or a title 
or an organization and so on. And, and all of that's super natural. And to some extent, I don't fault anyone for that. It makes sense to be protective of the things and people we hold dear. But I think there comes a point when we sometimes forget the true purpose that we originally showed up to serve. So if, if you're trying to sustain an organization or a program for its own sake, it's maybe time to say goodbye to the current situation and, and be open to what may follow afterward. It's why I appreciate one of the examples in the guide is from an organization that has dispersed itself into a number of of other things, um, Calgary Reads, they call that their dandelion strategy where they've, they've been the fluff of the dandelion that flies off to sow other seeds. Um, my belief here is also one of the reasons I've started having some hard conversations with a few of my colleagues about an initiative that we funded a number of years ago and still fund. And it seems at least to me that it may have moved beyond its original usefulness. And as a worst case scenario from a funder perspective, I kind of wonder if people and organizations um, involved in that initiative are taking the donation from us because they fear that it's that or nothing. And I would so much prefer an open and vulnerable conversation about what community members might rather have instead. So a uh, long-winded answer, but sustainability to me means whatever it means to the community members we're trying to center. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Kelly. Like, uh, you know, it really is unique to each person looking at it from their lens and what they're focused on. Um, what I'll contribute to this is I sort of see sustainability to understand it as a metaphor of a tree. So uh, people have heard me use this a number of times. I like metaphors. Um, so the tree trunk is kind of the collaboration, and that includes the people, the structure, and the organization. So the branches and leaves are the projects and the programs and activities that support the collaboration's compelling case. Um, and these can change. Some get more growth than others, um, some die off. Um, and then for the purposes of our conversation today, there's the root structure. And um, those are the contributing sustainability factors and, and resilience practices used by a collaboration that feed and support the trunk. So um, ultimately, the roots are the foundation for the collaboration. It's easy for people to become really hyper-focused on sustaining the leaves and the branches because they're what people most readily see. But there's great value in focusing effort in sustaining that trunk so that the collaboration thrives, really, regardless to which branches or, or leaves are growing at, at any time. So I hope that image is helpful for people to kind of place this conversation. And Natalie, did you have any thoughts? Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kelly, for that. Um, that response as well. And for me, I think sustainability does mean like having the practices and, and processes in place in order for your collaborative to be able to move their priorities forward. So having the leadership, having the funding partnerships, the tools in place. But Kelly, when you got us started like that, it, it reminded me of a, a passage in the guide that I, I'd like to read because it took, it, it grabbed my attention and I keep going back to it. And so, um, I'm on page seven. So there are also examples in which the work of a collaboration has very profoundly changed a community's way of working. The collaboration achieved, achieved its purpose and is no longer required, or perhaps the collaborative's work was absorbed into an existing institution or set of actors. Um, collaboratives should end when their work becomes part of how its larger ecosystem operates. And it's really interesting to think about sustainability and think about length of time or maybe assumptions of length of time or assumptions of uh, moving forward forever. And um, so I, I appreciate your comments, Kelly, and, and I really think that this passage um, in the guide was quite, quite helpful to think about examples where the work of a collaborative got absorbed into bigger work or the, the work of a collaborative actually reached its purpose. So. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, that Kelly, really thanks for centering us in that way. Um, I think a lot of the time we think about doing for rather than doing with community. 
Um, and we have to leave them in a situation where even after we're, we as like, I don't know, organizers come in, when we leave, they can still be able to sustain themselves. So we need to center them rather than centering us. So really, thank you for um, bringing that out. Um, so Mike, you know, what are some, like when we think about what requires this sustainability mindset, you know, in a collaborative work, what are some things like, can you really talk through that for us? Yeah, so um, without overly defining sustainability in the guide, we did, uh, Liz Weaver and I did break down sustainability into 10 factors that collectively support a sustainability mindset. So they fall under four categories. There's people. These are about who to involve, and they include things like equity and inclusion and in design, um, strong ties between partners, um, and broad community engagement. Then we've got a set that are um, labeled resources, and these are about the investments that are required, and they include things like adequate human and financial resources and partners who are contributing um, to shared outcomes. Um, so these factors are typically the ones that people think of first when it comes to sustainability, because they include the money and the stuff to get things done. Um, but as we're talking about, sustainability is so much more than that. Um, the third set is process, and these are about the uh, why and the how of collaboration, and they include things like um, having a com compelling case that drives the work forward, um, and having ongoing reflection and learning as a collaboration. The final set is impact, um, and these are kind of about the effect or influence of the collaborative effort and sort of telling the story. Um, they include things like an approach informed by data and evidence, uh, tracking and reporting progress and impact, um, and influencing policy and systems change. Um, these factors are all about demonstrating that nothing breeds success more than success. Um, so in the guide, if, uh, if you have a chance to take a, a closer look at it, you'll find that there's detailed descriptions for each of the 10 factors that I've shared. Um, and each has specific actions that contribute toward building sustainability with a collaboration. So for example, the factor where there's um, enough financial and human resources to achieve success, that includes things like building a budget and a funding plan, looking for resource commitments from partners so that it's um, you know, shared ownership um, and engaging with funders and investors so that you're kind of taking them along on the journey of the collaboration. Um, what I would say just to kind of wrap up this answer, um, so is to draw your attention to the um, factors that are often uh, least funded and they're the ones that involve uh, people and process. Um, if you're inclusive, if you center equity and are process focused and have the right people at the table who contribute their assets to the work of the collaborative effort, then the resources and the impact will flow from there. So my advice uh, in sort of wrapping up this uh, answer is to say, start with people and process as you build your sustainability mindset. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, and, you know, once you've built that sustainability mindset, you know, um, maybe, Natalie, I'll ask you this, you know, wh what do you think the difference is between sustainability and resilience? Because I think sometimes we confuse those two things. Um, maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Sure. And Mike uh, went over those factors for sustainability. Um, for resilience, um, it's really a focus on internal conditions uh, that are related to um, the collaborative health and, and collaborative well being. So, the ability to, for example, adapt to emerging opportunities uh, or to unanticipated challenges, the capacity to reflect on and bounce back from setbacks, um, being prepared for future challenges, um, maintaining mental, physical, and emotional stability of the collaborative. And so when you think about how to build resilience in a collaboration, you'd, you'd be thinking about things like increase um, adaptive uh, capability and the ability to anticipate some changes and shifts. And one of the things that, that is interesting here is that you'd, be, you'd wanna focus not only on the work and the content of your collaborative and some of the priorities, but at the same time, having that dual focus on uh, it, the external environment and the external uh, system and some of the shifts that are happening. Um, also, 
the resilience the resilience of a collaborative is um, being able to take a scan and to recognize the where um, a collaborative is vulnerable. So that means paying attention to shifting uh, funding or shifting policies or engagement uh, priorities and strategies. Um, so it's uh, it's really about learning to live both in the moment with a and with a view to the future. Um, and then finally, um, collaborative must be thinking about relationships, uh, building trust, and looking at uh, who are um, the partners and the community members that they need to engage with. Um, and having a, a scan of the, the ecosystem and building the capacity and strategies to engage and continuously engage with those partners. And so that would, all of those would help maintaining, maintain that mental, physical and emotional stability uh, of the collaborative. Thanks, Natalie. And Kelly, I'll just pull you in here from a funder perspective. Um, you know, what are some considerations around sustainability? Yeah, I mean, from a funder's perspective, I, I have a perspective that I'll share here, but I also feel like it needs a giant asterisk that says, I know everything I'm about to say is probably easier said than done, especially with some funders. But if we really want to talk about sustaining the values of, of like you, you said, Rute, doing with rather than doing for, which by the way is something that our organization learned from Tamarack Institute folks a number of years ago and it continues to make its way into like our conversations on a daily or weekly basis with, with others at Suncor. So thank you for that. Anyway, if we're going to sustain that and other similar types of values, then I think we need to be a bit brave um, and think about what we need for a long time to come. So with bravery and, and long-term sustenance in mind, I really encourage people to engage funders early and transparently on these kinds of things. So Mike talked about the, the types of sustainability factors that are needed. One of the reasons that longer-term financial sustainability gets pushed off and often maybe a bit too late is that the earlier stages of collaboration are really hard, like really hard. There's so many of the early months and years of initiatives that are spent building trust and strengthening the relationships between the partners who are collaborating. And then by the time that trust and strength are there, all of a sudden it's the end of the funding period, it's close at hand. And, and we can't, I don't think we can, and I don't think we should try to change that reality because moving at the speed of trust is really important. But we need to be realistic about it. And funders need to stop pretending that collaboration is magically accomplished by a kickoff meeting. And the partners on a project need to share really fully with funders about how long it's taking to establish trust. And the kind of trust that will make the project successful and sustainable in the longer term. Some things you might consider, depending on your funder, is you could even invite the funders to participate in that messiness. Um, maybe in my naive, hopeful world, the funder would learn the realities of the collaboration firsthand and then perhaps be open to funding longer relationship building periods in the future. Or maybe the funder will see where some of their our processes and requirements are getting in the way of your collaborative work and we could remove those barriers if we knew about them and I mean even if you don't have us participating directly you could tell us where the barriers are and, and suggest ways to get rid of them I, again I know there's a huge amount of power that comes with my role and that no matter how many times I try to conduct myself in a, a safe way for community organizations, the philanthropic structures that I work in are, are not safe. They're always going to mean that people might fear being honest with me, um, could fear that it could risk their funding. And yet, if we don't face that challenge and that fear head on, and if we don't try to mitigate it um, and try to challenge the power dynamics, then we're all just going to keep upholding this flawed system and the, and the things about 
the the funding setup that currently can make um, collaboration really hard. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And as you were talking, I was just kind of thinking too, like as sometimes with funding, there are like certain requirements that you have to meet as a collaborative, and sometimes that doesn't necessarily fit with you know what community needs and stuff. So how do you balance that? I mean, for us. If we know about it and we know how it's getting in the way, we'll we'll try to change what we can to make it easier. Our, we have a set of things that we need to accomplish for, for our funder. Um, we have quite a bit of room to maneuver, but there's still some things that we need to do and, and things we need to do to also satisfy things like Canada Revenue Agency requirements. But there's lots of ways to accomplish what we need. And if we know how our stuff is getting in the way of, of an initiative or the timing of it doesn't work for the partners or anything like that, if we know about it, then we can try to change it. And often we just don't know about it. I, I find people are really hesitant to tell us what's wrong with us. And like I say, I know, I know why that is, but, but we can't fix it if we don't know. And, I, you know, I think funders are, are changing. I'm seeing that happening where, I mean, you know, you can think of examples where they've totally turned funding on its head, like the circle, which actually is the opposite, where instead of applying for funding, they're inviting people to uh, funders to come to them with their proposals of how to support their work, which I think is fantastic. But things like trust based philanthropy, um, unrestricted funds, longer term funding, all those kinds of things we're starting to see a shift, right? And I think you're right, Kelly, like it's having open conversation about this, these things and our needs. Um, and I think part of that work has to be on funders to help flatten the power dynamic to say, we're, we are in this together um, and we wanna hear from you and, and we won't um, slap you on the wrist for uh, being honest with us about what we need, so, or what yeah, you need. Yeah, and like I say, I know a lot of this is easier said than done. and. And if any of our audience gets government funding, um, they may be like, mm, that's not happening. But I've also, I've, in a past life, that gang prevention project I mentioned was federally funded. And there were lots of things we couldn't change about the reporting processes and that kind of thing. And yet the conversations I had with our program officer were so insightful. Um, she was super flexible and she smoothed over a lot of the requirements or at least the deadlines to be able to help um, help us meet them in a way that worked for our project. Um, and Natalie, I kind of wanted to ask, um, I know um, TAMRAC, we kind of fund communities through our um, Community Innovation Fund through CBYF. I'm curious how we manage that from a funder perspective, how? Mm -hmm we manage those barriers with our communities? Yeah, so very good question. One of the things that we've uh, done, so with, with Communities Building Youth Futures model, um, we've received some funding through the Government of Canada and we are funding communities with for innovation fund, but also for operational uh, work and some staffing. Um, but one of the big, um, parts of the model of community building these futures is this, the support that we offer communities for implementing a collective impact approach. And so our communities receive the support of um, our, our managers of communities and as well our expert coaches at Tamra. So one of the things that we've done in order to, like the, the priority really is to build capacity of communities to do this kind of work. So we don't want anything to get in the way of that, even if uh, sometimes when you do, when you offer a grant and you're seen as a funder, it's very different than when you're uh, trying to support capacity building. So one, so we've um, really uh, separated the, the roles around uh, offering the capacity building and offering that coaching, as well as some of the work that I would do, for example, with communities, which is really like grant management. Um, the other thing that we've, we are doing is we're trying to be, um, take an approach of 
of participatory grant making approaches around decision making around flexibility around grants. There are some some areas where uh, there's more or less flexibility, but as much as possible, we uh, we um, try to provide to those communities some flexible flexibility around accountability and, and reporting and things. But really, we focus a lot on the capacity building around collective impact. Hope I answered your question there. Yes, thank you. Um, and we've kind of all touched on this a little bit, but you know, what challenges do collaboratives encounter as they try to you know, go on their sustainability journey. Um, Mike, maybe we can go to you. Yeah, so, I mean, we've been talking about the obvious ones around funding and resourcing and things like that. Um, you know, so I've made a bit of a list of the ones that I've kind of encountered in talking to people through the through the stories for the guide and through our advisory. Um, and so uh, I'll go through them and then hopefully um, Kelly and Natalie, if you want to jump in. So um, lacking a plan with benchmarks that are smarter, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound, evaluated and reviewed. So, I mean, just like anything else that you develop a plan for, um, sustainability requires all of those elements um, to be able to take uh, specific action. Um, Focusing on very specific actions rather than on the sustainability of the larger worker function of the collaborative, which then would support those specific actions. So, yes, you may have a program or a project that you're um, particularly proud of as a collaboration um, and you want to keep that going, but to keep it thriving, you need to keep the collaboration going. So start there first. Um, waiting to the last minute to consider sustainability. So, you know, when funding community support or partnerships um, have started to or are dried up um, or eroded, then it's much harder to, um, to kickstart them again. Um, not being patient um, and bringing funders and partners and the broader community uh, along on the journey of developing um, your collective sustainability plan. It really requires everyone's um, input and uh, attention. And so if you leave out partners, um, you're, it's not going to be as strong. And as Kelly mentioned, you have to go at the, tr at the pace of trust. Um, and so be patient with yourselves as you're, as you're bringing everybody together. Um, thinking that everyone, everything needs to be sustained. We've talked about this actually quite a bit today, which I'm, I'm glad. Um, not everything necessarily should. Um, if things have in, served their intended purpose and are no longer required, um, or others uh, could take on the work that has been started so that the collaboration can continue to focus on its main work, then that's great. Um, Kelly alluded to the uh, Calgary Reads example in the in the guide. I think that's a fantastic example of um, you know programs were working are working great um, and they can continue to exist. But it doesn't have to be the core work of the collaboration. Um, whatever the collaboration's main raison d'etre should be what people return to, not the specific programs. Um, thinking about sustainability from a scarcity or competition mindset rather than one of opportunity, optimism, and abundance. So this one's hard, right? Because you know, when you feel like the resources are scarce, it's hard to think with optimism. Um, you know, but I just did some training yesterday uh, around asset-based development um, connected to sustainability. And if you use existing resources and assets and build on them for sustained action, um, you know, you can go a lot further. They're, they're really everywhere when you look more closely at what's available in the community. Um, and then finally, uh, and most importantly, from my perspective, not centering equity in the structure and the work of the collaboration. If you don't flatten power dynamics and um, make sure that everyone is uh, included, uh, both in the work that the collaborative effort seeks to do, but also in how it's done and how those people are authentically engaged in the effort, um, it just won't be successful. So I invite Kelly and Natalie to jump in too. Sure, I think the part of the guide I wanted to emphasize in this, in this response around challenges actually also gets at, I see a question in the Q&A box about the collaboration spectrum, which at least on the English version of the guide is, is page eight. And I think one of the challenges I see is that people don't always share in a common definition of what it means to collaborate. So if you look at the collaboration spectrum, 
it's really important for partners to understand and, and agree on where they truly are on that spectrum and where they hope to get. So I'll just flip to it myself and reference that, that gang prevention work that I did in the past. There were 25 partners that were involved to some extent in that project and then three or four who were involved on a day-to-day -day basis really deeply. And we bounced around this spectrum all the time. There were some partners that I'd go to meetings with and hope to talk about some things that might work for the youth and the families. And I'd suddenly find myself in a competition zone on the left end of the spectrum, you know, not collaborative at all because the people I was talking to wanted to protect their own client list and protect the um, desire to, for them to keep working with certain youth rather than, than work with the youth together. There were other times we'd go to meetings and we'd be somewhere in the middle of the spectrum around communicating or cooperating about a particular situation. Um, it was actually really rare, despite describing ourselves as, as a collaborative, that we were on the right end of the spectrum of full-on collaboration. And so if I think about challenges, um, I think we need to be candid with ourselves and each other that maybe we're only at coexist or communicate. And if we don't clarify the kinds of steps that we all need to take, if we're going to get further to the right on the spectrum around coordinating, collaborating, even integrating, we're, we're just going to flounder, flounder down the road. And certainly, you know, as you reach the end of a funding period, it's time to renew agreements. If you haven't sorted out those issues, then the likelihood of swinging back to the competition end is, is super scarily likely. I think one of the other challenges I've faced in that, particularly in that same project, but others as well, is collaborative projects over a long period of time will see turnover in the people involved, like the actual individuals, each of us. So there will be people coming and going. Um, and some of that challenge and, and how to mitigate it is addressed on page 52, 53 of the guide under resilience practices. But to me, it's really important to hold a common vision and clarity about the day-to-day -day practices needed for that vision in ways that you're continually circling back with all the people involved. Each person that touches the project needs to buy into why it, it exists, why it's being done collaboratively, what their role is, what their role is not, who they need to each depend on, who they need to engage from the partner organizations and so on. And every time there's a change to a partner's representative, that cycle of trust building and onboarding to those collaborative norms has to start again, which is both beautiful and frustrating. And, and um, when I had to initiate that cycle over and over in that last job, what I mentioned, I mean, you can imagine 25 partners means quite a bit of change. It, I needed to do it in different ways that suited different organizations' needs. The way that I onboarded the police that were working with us to the project was very different from how I framed the approach that we needed to take with school board representatives, for example. And then I'll just add that this need for onboarding is also true of people who the various partners don't see all the time. Maybe it's a new CEO at one of the organizations or new board members at every partner organization, keeping in mind that some of those board members may have never encountered the governance mindsets that are required to support collaboration, particularly in this sector where board members might come to us from more win-lose business backgrounds. We have work to do to ensure that the people who are meant to support and sustain our collaboration need to understand why we, why we collaborate in the ways that we do. So there's like that trust in relationship and communication piece is just so all consuming. Um, Natalie, did you have any thoughts before we move forward? Well, Kelly, I think you touched on what I was going to, to mention. When you look at the spectrum and some of the challenges where when your goal is to be closer to the right-hand side around the collaborate and integrate, with Communities Building Youth Futures, we did uh, work with each community. So each community had on their leadership table, they had 
um, community nonprofits and uh, youth and funders or government and the business sector. And when we implemented that model that we asked, um, you know, to really set up that collaboration right from the beginning, we saw early on that it's one thing to ask to have those four sectors around the table. And it's another thing to know how to engage and how do you engage youth and how do you engage uh, the voice of lived experience um, with people around the table who are used to only working with people that, you know, they're, they're normal partners. And so um, very early on, we developed uh, a guide for meaningful youth engagement to help support communities and to help support leadership tables to know what does that mean, uh, engaging youth and having youth as part of your leadership table and having youth as part of decision makers. What does it mean for the adult allies around the table? So, and I think you spoke to it, Kelly, like you're the different uh, frames of mind you had when you onboarded different people. So as a collaborative, how do you do that together? I'll uh, just jump in uh, a little bit about that onboarding folks. And so, and there's actually a question in the chat about it as well. So um, the the reality of people coming and going from collaboratives is, is natural. There's ebbs and flows both to the work and to people's personal lives. So I wouldn't see it necessarily as a bad thing, first of all, because I think renewal is sometimes a good thing, having new fresh perspectives. Um, Relooking just as you would with a board of directors, what skills do you need around the table, what assets to move the work forward. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that um, the collaborative should be based on a compelling case. So regardless of who's at the table, that compelling case is what should be moving folks forward. If that case changes, that's different. That means that potentially a new collaboration needs to be formed or you need to relook at what the collaboration um, currently is doing. Um, but ultimately the, the, um, the, uh, the, the compelling case should frame why everybody's around the table. One other um, strategy you can use, and I've seen it at collaborations, is if uh, a partner is changing the representative that they attach to the collaborative effort, you can do a transition where two people attend for a while so that the, the trust isn't sort of lost as the one person exits and you need to establish it with a new person. That person from the partner organization or wherever can help um, mentor the person into uh, the collaborative effort. Great. Thanks for all those uh, wonderful answers. Um, so we've talked about challenges then, um, and sustainability might seem daunting now with all those challenges, but what are some advice, like what is some advice you can give to people looking at, to collaboratives looking into their sustainability journey? Um, Kelly, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Sure, and I will attempt to also answer Chris's question in the Q&A box, which I started typing to respond to Chris, and uh, we'll see if I can do a better job verbally. I think I've become um, a recent convert to the idea of norms, and it became really important for our team during the pandemic to set norms, and I'm laughing because uh, I don't know if any of my team members are on the call or they'll maybe watch the recording and, and they'll laugh back at me because I have really pushed back against them for wanting, I think at one page, by one point we had 12 pages of norms. And my position has been, if you can't remember what the norms are, then they're not really going to work. But the reason we had 12 pages and we've since pared back is because we recognize, and I do agree with this part, that norms need to be big picture things like the kinds of values and principles and ways of working broadly that will sustain a collaborative, things like respect. But if you don't all define what respect means, then it's it's not really worth anything because you know um, for some people respect is having the courage to tell me when you think that I'm saying something that doesn't make any sense or doesn't align to what's needed. For other people, respect is like, let me say face and don't ever push back on me. Those are opposite things. 
So we really pushed ourselves in our developing of norms to, to be that specific on the big picture values. And then we also pushed ourselves to have norms on like how we, how we email. Um, when is, do we want to say what time of day that happens? Do we want to say that after a collaboration meeting of some kind, who handles the follow-up action items? Is it the meeting chair who then goes around and checks in with everyone that they're doing what they said they would and so on? So I'll step back a bit and get to, to Rute your question. Um, I think one of the main pieces of advice I would give is to make your assumptions and your expectations really explicit with your collaborative partners, right down to the detailed level. If we've learned anything in the recent and super important push to engage more voices and more lived experiences in our work, I hope we've learned that not all people think the same way. And none of us are mind readers either. If we're going to be truly inclusive and effective at working in diverse groups, then we need to be willing to share our intentions with each other. We need to be willing to ask each other about the assumptions that we each hold, assumptions that might very well be invisible to others, even if you think that they're central to the thing you're collaborating on. So I'm not just referring, again, this is where the norms part comes into play, to the why of the collaborative work, though that's really important to have a shared understanding of that. I'm also talking about a shared understanding and super clear expectations around day-to-day -day things like, okay, so you're going to send that email or you want me to do it. I think one place, if I reference back to the guide again, to start doing more of this is a deeper dive into section three of the guide, exploring and learning how various partners and contributors to your initiative answer the questions in that section could get you a long way to establishing norms if you don't already have them. Um, thanks, Kelly. Mike, how about you? Any advice? Yeah, so my advice in delving deeper into this um, topic in the past year or so is really to be really intentional around doing this work, right? Um, it doesn't happen off the side of a desk. So sustainability and centering equity and collaboration um, needs to be done very purposefully. So, um, you know, as we've talked about things like defining sustainability, defining what your collaboration is and what you seek to do together, um, determining the things that need to be sustained, um, creating an action plan. Um, so Tamarack has developed um, out of the guide um, a sustainability self-assessment tool that might be helpful for uh, folks to use. Um, and then the other piece would be to be patient, um, that it takes time to do this work. Um, you know, the speed of trust again, collaborative work is always about people first and foremost. And so um, while you're doing the work of thinking about sustainability, um, build the community buy-in, build in the relationship building that needs to happen because um, the strength of a collaboration is, is the people around the table. And so um, if you're intentional in working with people, your, your collaboration has a, a much better chance of being sustained. Um, I'll just quickly address to one question that was in the chat too about um, do, are there any examples of um, collaboratives that have turned into um, communities of practice or learning? Um, and so the, out of the 10 that are in our guide, no, um, they still function as collaborations. Um, the closest would be what Kelly mentioned around Calgary Reads as an example. Uh, I'm not sure what direction they're going. They may involve a, a component of um, of a community of practice as they reimagine themselves. Um, but what I would say is when, so you have to think of sustainability right from the start. So if a collaboration wants to function as a, a community of practice, build it that way. Um, there's nothing wrong with having that um, as part of your, your function right from the beginning. Um, and then collaboration uh, efforts, like actually the, the project work or the programs um, can, can happen. Um, a good example in Hamilton that I'm thinking about, which is where I am, is uh, the Street Youth Planning Collaborative. 
So they continue to work together on um, meeting the needs of street involved and homeless youth in Hamilton, regardless of what projects they're working on. And so they share learning and they share um, in um, policy, um, uh, poli trying to shift policy at a government level. So a collaborative can play multiple roles. Sorry, I had to go off on that one. Uh, Natalie? Yeah, I don't have a lot to um, to add because both of you um, basically talked about what I was going to say, which is really um, a lot of us get into this kind of work with the intention and with certain goals. And we, when collaboratives are set up, we, if we don't um, have our principles and our norms uh, after today, some of us are going to develop some of those norms and principles for working together. But if we think about the work of collaboratives as a linear process, then, then I think it's a little bit of a trap because what we've noticed is that if you set up your leadership table and you are intentional about, um, about flattening power dynamics and you have shifts in your leadership table, it's almost like it has to be circular. You have to re relook at some of the original intentions after a period, of, after some time goes by. So one of the things that we've noticed is, you know, if you if you have a uh, you set up your leadership table and you develop a common agenda and you develop your priorities, sometimes after that work, you need to go back to okay, who's on our leadership table? Do we need to add more people? Um, do we have the right partners? How have we onboarded the new people? You continue with your prior, you know, can, your priorities, and you you keep thinking about okay, do I have the tools in place in order to speak to the the compelling case for this work? And so having that approach where you're revisiting, and that tool is a perfect example of how to do that. You're revisiting um, the original intentions for doing the work and being really mindful about how you're gonna to continue to develop those partnerships, those relationships, how you're gonna have the process and, and tools in place that will help um, establish that resiliency. So I'm more or less reiterating what my two uh, colleagues have said. Thanks, Natalie. So now I'm thinking, I've heard the challenges, the advice I've, I've learned about sustainability. What's my next step? What do I do after all this? What's the first thing I would do if I'm like, okay, I want to begin my sustainability journey. Who wants to take that on? Um, I would probably say, so I think it's having the conversation about with your whole group about what sustainability means. I think that's really what's come out of this conversation over and over again is that you really need to understand what it is for your for your group and no one person can have that that perspective and and that's where the sustainability plan lands it has to include everyone so i would suggest engaging um, at multiple levels, um, folks in a conversation. So Natalie talked about, you know, at a leadership table or a board of directors, um, but have conversations with the, the public and how they buy in, how the community buys into the work that you're doing, um, who's most impacted by the collaborative effort that you do. Um, and I, it's really about having that conversation and defining what sustainability means. The danger of not going first is that you may have to start thinking about your answer and then figure out a different one when, when Mike says the thing you were going to say. But I, I do wonder, I mean, I, I don't want to presume what any of the audience is, is thinking at this point. I also want to say that the guide is an ideal world that most of us don't live in. And so recognizing that and recognizing that, you know, it's March of 2023, every single person in your community, every single person you collaborate with has been through a pretty rough several years. And, and I would like, I like to continue to remind people that none of us are okay. I don't think if you are, I'm very, very happy for you. But I think many of us are just hanging in there. And so I like your question, Rute, because what I what I want to emphasize is we don't need to get 
all of our work to be guide leading practice level perfect right away if ever i mean perfectionism is a a, a dangerous thing brought to us by the makers of capitalism and colonialism and all kinds of other things that we should really investigate and and there are always steps that we can take to do a little bit better and maybe building on what mike said the next step is just to think about one thing you'd like to see done better or differently and go and talk to somebody else in your collaborative about whether they see the need for that too and go from there. Thanks everyone. I'm just looking at the time. I wanna make sure we don't go over. Um, thanks Mike, Kelly, Natalie, this was a great discussion and thanks to everyone for their questions and comments. Um, this is part of a four-part webinar series, so there will be another one coming up uh, on April 19th, where we will be going a little bit in-depth and sharing stories from Hamilton, uh, as well as Newfoundland and, and Labrador. Um, so I'm sure Jamie will put that in the chat at some point. Um, yeah, and we do have other events coming up too, so feel free to check our event listing um, for other webinars, as well as um, in-person events and virtual ones too. Um, thank you to our speakers and thank you for everything, um, to everybody rather, um, and we hope you have a great day. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs>